I want to thank HSDF for putting this on. Uh, super important to get this message out. And thank you for pointing out the, the, the questions. Uh, undoubtedly, these two gentlemen are going to be making some statements that you're going to have some questions. Fire away. We're going to try our best to weave those in and not just sort of bucket them at the end. I think that makes it a little bit more interesting and a little bit more real time. So um, please do that. And I'll encourage you if I don't see a, a nice uh, queue of questions coming in. Bob, we're going to start with you. Um, two things, I guess. One observation is you've been there just about in a year, not quite a year, but uh, going on a year. That went by pretty fast. And I, I'm sure you, you've discovered a lot of things. Just want to start with sort of a state of the state. And I'd also like you to just make sure we baseline, because we did get some questions in, uh, what your role is inside of CISA, you know, as the CIO versus sort of the CISA role, if you will. Mm -hmm. and, and oftentimes that gets sort of mixed up, right? But I think that's really important for this audience to understand as we go through this conversation. Yeah, no, I, I think those are, are two great things to discuss. So it's been about a year, like you said, about coming up on 11 months. It'll be a year at the end of August. So uh, definitely uh, discovered a lot. You know, a lot has happened in that period of time. Uh, we're definitely maturing a lot of our processes, kind of building a component CIO office. I really do think, think it's going to take a few years to kind of get to the same level of, say, an IES or CVP, uh, where we're doing all those functions our, our, ourselves. Uh, and so in some areas, maybe I've slowed down some work because we're not quite there at that maturity level as we kind of stabilize other areas. Uh, being part of CISA, I have the same challenges as any other uh, CIO in, in government. You, you know, I'm, I'm doing ATOs, I'm doing our own monitoring, I'm, I'm working to implement the executive orders uh, across the board. Uh, and you brought up a really good point there. What is the CIO's role at, at CISA? Uh, and it's largely the internal systems at, at, at CISA. You, you know, I'm building like, you know, transport networks for uh, the cybersecurity division. And we're working uh, through that to provide kind of core services, you know, collaboration tools, uh, endpoints, mobility, all, all those, those big things. Uh, my role is not that of the cybersecurity director that works with the rest of the FSEB to maybe monitor their, their implementation of the executive order or help them you know, with their patching or CDM uh, or, or other functions. Uh, my role on those programs is to enable the programs inside at CISA through my role as a CIO. So, you know, of course, I'm going, I'm sure you remember the, the fun ITAR approval process, mm -hmm. you, you know, making sure their systems can get ATOs, providing them the monitoring services and those other functions. That, that any other CIO would. Uh, but there is still large portions and always will be of application development done outside the CIO's office here. Uh, you know, but working tightly with our uh, SELC processes and, and other functions. So it is a, uh, I say it's a pretty unique role here at, at DHS where, uh, you know, I'm responsible for doing IT at really the cyber agency uh, of, of DHS. So it can be a little bit tough. Uh, we're a pretty small organization, about 90 feds. Uh, you know, doing great work every day, everything from working out in the field uh, to, you know, back here at headquarters. And that's one of the, the big areas we're going to exp expand in uh, FY23. A lot of people don't know that CISA has a very large field presence, uh, you know, protective security advisors, chemical security advisors, our, our regional directors. So I'm starting to embed my folks out in the field and provide, you know, improved services out there so that they have the same level of technology as we do here at, at headquarters. Interesting, a couple of things, and Mike, I'll get to you in just a, a second here, I wanna pull on a couple of threads. One is, how, how big is CISA? Is it 5,000 you know, strong? Is it 500,000? How big is it? Uh, the, under 5,000, uh, we have, I think on board right now, probably about 2,300, 2,500 feds. Okay. Uh, and then a, a contractor workforce that uh, you know, brings us just shy of, I think about 5,000. Uh, you know, working on our network. We mm -hmm. do have, uh, you, you know, you've probably seen a lot of our recruiting events. We have a lot of job openings here. I definitely uh, encourage anyone interested in working at CISA to check us out on USA Jobs. There's a lot of really exciting opportunities here as we grow. Uh, you know, we re received a lot of plus ups through some of the, the, the recent uh, budget acts. 
Absolutely. Uh, relatively small, but mighty, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, about how many field sites? I, I, I think there are a lot of folks that don't realize that you have a, a big footprint out there. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. So we mirror the FEMA region. So as you're familiar with, you know, region one, New England, region two, New York, Puerto Rico, uh, we typically have a regional office. Uh, but then we also have at least one person in, in every state that serves as a cybersecurity advisor to, to the state. And that those are actually mandated by law. Uh, we also, uh, you, you, you know, each region has a different footprint. I was just up at TDY in New York City last week. We have about, I think about 38 people that, that work in, in the, the regional office there. Uh, and then we do op operate a, a large facility out, down in Florida. Uh, as well. Right. I've heard about, I recall uh, the, the facility in, in Florida. And in respect to sort of, uh, you know, let, let's call them systems of record, ATO systems, just roughly, you know, I, I don't want to hold you to it. Is it, is it 550 or 500 of those? Uh, or less you, than 50 I, I, I'm more sure than as five. a new CIO, you're still counting, right? Uh, yeah, it's definitely uh, less than 50, more than five. Okay. Uh, yeah. We're, we're going to go through maybe some consolidation, I think. Yeah. Of, yeah. Some new just, approaches we could take. Just trying to get everyone sort of, mm -hmm. you know, sized up on the picture. One last question before I send it over to Mike here, and that is um, around, you, you, you said the word ourselves, right? And I think it is important for folks to know that as, as uh, CISA used to be MPPD, was part of the composite at headquarters, completely served by headquarters, is now its own operating entity, right? Its own operating component. And so they're building that out. So you wanna talk a little bit about what, what, what is that and what does that mean? And, and sort of what journey are you on in regards to snapping off the mothership, if you will, and becoming your own sort of autonomous, autonomous loosely speaking, uh, operating component? I think it's really hard because I don't think it's been done at this level uh, in, in a long time. I think we're still the largest, uh, the newest, uh, like large mid-sized federal agency. You know, we haven't had a split like this in DHS in some time. I can't even re remember the last one, you know, FPS and a few OBIMs moved around a little bit, but not a whole new component. So, uh, you know, on my side, it, it is really uh, doing things, you know, there's some days where I'm you know, there's been days I'm handing out laptops or configuring stuff there. So you get to get a little more hands on. Uh, we have some exciting news. Our component acquisition executive gets initial procurement authority early July. That's a huge, huge deal. You know, we're going to have our own uh, 1102 contracting officers. Uh, th there's a lot of work too internally just on our own identity and culture uh, as well as we become you know, CISA, which to your point, MPPD was a headquarters uh, component under management. Uh, and now we're, you know, a component of, you know, equal rank to TSA or CBP. So we're developing our own culture here as well. A lot of different moving parts, Mike, let me throw it over to you. Uh, hearing what, uh, what Bob is going to undoubtedly, as, as you all are sort of striped across the interagency, you see a lot of different things. What does uh, uh, one sort of discover when they're in that kind of environment and um, uh, observations from the point of view of where they are on this journey right now? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think that's one of the unique things about working uh, on the vendor side of the equation uh, is that we do get that broad perspective across lots of different agencies. And uh, folks in those agencies are really come to us to you know, solve problems and to figure out what the direction of cybersecurity is, where to focus, what the priorities are, the direction of technology. Uh, and we've seen, you know, a lot of focus, for example, as a result of the EO and CISA's efforts on improving, you know, basic cyber hygiene, uh, speeding up things like ATO processes, adapting to uh, the requirements of that EO. For example, zero trust has been a big topic of conversation and one that I've been focused on myself. And trying to make those things actionable and usable for our, uh, our users and our CIO community. Uh, you know, things that we can do to actually today improve our security posture, uh, to, you know, fix holes in our uh, cyber hygiene. I know one of our poll questions was, for example, around tech debt, you know, how to eliminate tech debt, modernize systems, take legacy systems that maybe we can't modernize and adapt those to the requirements of say, robust identity or access control schemes and management. And that's really what we focus on. Uh, and 
to that extent, uh, working also with you know the rest of the IT community, uh, understanding you know where the state of technology is today that can help and provide solutions to those issues, as well as uh, figure out where we can apply our engineering resources and leadership to further that technology. Good examples would be uh, places like SigStore, a project that we are fostering through the Linux community uh, to help provide software attestations so that we can provide verifiable software supply chains uh, and components. Working with the SBOM community, for example, to provide uh, that bill of materials for our software system so that in the event we have vulnerabilities, we can assess uh, where our software is and where we need to patch or update uh, mm -hmm. our systems or where those vulnerabilities might lie within our infrastructure. So we can take remedial or remediate mitigating actions uh, for that. Sure. And, and this, of course, has been a, a huge help in that respect because they provide the guidance, the locus point for industry to collaborate uh, and to share that information. And Red Hat has been participating in that process and hopefully providing that guidance uh, for our customers, for our CIOs, uh, when those types of incidents happen, or to uh, you know work within that industry and work within the security research community to provide best practices for avoiding those vulnerabilities in the first place. And no question, uh, any CIO that enters on duty has to kind of get a baseline of, of, of what they're dealing with. You're in a in a even more unique situation, Bob, because of the snap off situation that's happening, right? You know, what's what stays at the mothership? What comes down here? Uh, what is my baseline? And then putting a plan together to to start to get out of that technical debt, and then actually execute it. Uh, all things uh, interesting. We do have a, an early question, which is actually a good one. Uh, and I said I was going to fire these in, so please keep coming with them. Bob, you mentioned surging in some areas, pausing in others. What areas are you surging on? It's a good question. Yeah, no, it's a really good question. A lot of it uh, leads to our recruiting areas. Uh, you know, when I came in, uh, part of being part of uh, or formerly, you know, a headquarters unit, uh, some of our tech isn't meeting the needs of uh, the people that work at CISR or that we're, we're recruiting. So I'm pushing out maybe a little bit more heavier on, you, you know, the ability to support Macs, Androids, uh, other devices. Uh, you know, where uh, a good example is in December when we rolled out Slack. Uh, you, you know, we need different communication methods and we really need to be a place where people want to come to work for the tech. And oftentimes uh, the, you know, the teams and the people that we're recruiting, maybe they don't want to use just Microsoft products. Maybe they don't just want to use Windows. Uh, and I want to be able to, to support that. Uh, the other area we're, we're surging very, very heavily on our internal security, uh, you, you know, ensuring that CISA uh, is adhering to its own guidelines and mandates. Uh, and that's an area that I'm uh, investing a substantial amount of time and resources. Uh, you, you know, against right now, just to make sure that we're, you know, setting the bar pretty high. No question. Yeah. You know, uh, you need to be the gold standard, right? Um, and and that, that certainly makes sense. Uh, let's talk about zero trust, right? This is a, a conversation around zero trust. We're going to hear from sort of the, the top level interagency a little bit later on in the show, but a, a unique perspective here, again, because you're at CISA, but, but from the perspective of a component, right? As an operating component, right? You got the paper laid on you, the orders, so to speak, uh, very much originated from CISA, right? The, the part of CISA you support, uh, instructing you all on what you're gonna need to do and what the expectations are there. How do you attack that? You know, How do you embrace that, uh, examine that, and then tell us about the journey you're on in regards to zero trust. And I say journey, and I always make sure to say architecture, right? Um, yeah. I think that's really important. But yeah, tell us about the the state of the state in that regard. Well, I, I think, in, and I'm sure Michael touched on it too. Like in a lot of areas here, uh, I, I would say the the capabilities that I stepped into were maybe a little less than I had at CBP. Uh, so we're working a lot on the maturity area, whether that's identity management, you know, iCam solutions. Uh, Automation is, is going to be really big for us. Uh, you know, we're kind of lacking some of that uh, right now. Like our onboarding and offboarding process isn't where it needs to be. And it introduces a lot of um, 
frustrations and concerns for me. So in some areas, I'm maybe uh, starting from a different place uh, than some of the other components. The advantage that I think I have is we're greenfielding a lot of solutions. So I get to build them maybe to a more modern standard and reduce some of that that technical debt or, or not trying to modernize systems that maybe are gonna be really difficult uh, to modernize. We've all been through that uh, you know, in our careers. And I, I have a little bit of an advantage there where some of the solutions we're building are gonna be greenfield. It's gonna be a little bit more controlled. I did, you know, I had some goals in mind uh, this year. We met a lot of them. Some of them are gonna slip and that's okay because I wanna build a really strong foundation that CISA can build on for a decade. Uh, and so I'd rather take a six month slip on a project uh, than build a really poor foundation. So that's what we're concentrating on identity, uh, monitoring systems, uh, and building our people and teams up. Uh, you, you know, deciding what the federal to partner, you know, contractor makeup is going to look like uh, and what skill sets that we need. Interesting. You, you, you have the ability to sort of lay down a fresh set of tracks. It re, re reminds me of sort of these legacy airlines that have, you know, uh, seven different types of aircraft and unions and they're trying to deal with all the maintenance and then you get a, a jet blue or a southwest you know one type of aircraft you know online ticketing bang you know they're just much more simplicity as far as uh, what you're able to do mike you're seeing this from a different dimension uh you're seeing it in, in a uh, <laughs> in a lot of those legacy uh, uh um uh agencies uh primarily um and as they try to introduce them, many of them trying to follow the letter of the law, if you will. Uh, but I think everyone recognizes that, hey, that, that it is a journey. Uh, we have to uh, implement based on uh, levels of risk and timing, et cetera. What's your perspective of how, you know, give us a, a, a paint a picture there and give us maybe even a scorecard of what you're seeing out there in regards to uh, the uh, the ecosystem's ability to implement uh, this architecture? Yeah, I think that's a great question, especially like framing it as like a scorecard, because uh, I think there is a lot of uneven adoption, uneven understanding and application of these concepts and zero trust architectures in general. But that's not to say that uh, we haven't already made a lot of progress. Part of that is because the concepts aren't new. And in fact, as a vendor, one of the things that we like to highlight with a lot of these legacy um, and CIO agencies is the fact that there's a tremendous amount of untapped capability that they can be taking advantage of today uh, to improve their cybersecurity posture, lay the framework and the foundation for those zero trust architectures. And a lot of that comes down to uh, using the technology in the way that fosters zero trust architectures. And for example, takes existing identity or access management systems and simply applies the appropriate and zero trust policies to that. And we talked, and I think one of the, again, the poll question was around automation. I've been really focusing on, on the role of automation, how that will play towards enabling zero trust architectures. Uh, and again, agencies already have automation solutions out there. Uh, the recent rise of cloud platforms, managed services and things like that, for example, through FedRAMP and other agencies uh, has also allowed us to apply that concept of hyper automation of using the automated capabilities or the, or the inherent capabilities of those systems of those services as part of a zero trust strategy to get to zero trust faster and to make sure we can do so with confidence and with minimal business disruption right uh, a lot of these class systems one we've been moving towards uh, for a long time and two uh, these systems are designed inherently to make it easy for us to move legacy infrastructure to them uh, and that combination can be very powerful, especially if used in the right way. The other thing that we like to highlight too is uh, the fact that, uh, you know, zero trust and you use the word journey, right? Is that uh, it is going to be a long journey that uh, there's gonna be places that different agencies, depending on, you know, what their current posture is, uh, will have different starting points and will have different places where the immediate application of uh, processes or technologies can have more impact than others. And while, for example, automation might be pretty ubiquitous, uh, different agencies will have, for example, more mature network and network security infrastructure versus say application oriented uh, access controls. And by applying the right strategy in the right place, we can make more headway faster. So really we're helping our agencies understand the best place to apply uh, solutions and navigate that overall architecture to get to that final 
practical of implementing zero trust architecture. Yeah, you know, it's interesting that you're, you, you point this out. I recall a conversation I was having. I can't remember, Bob, if you were on that show or not, but uh, um, it was the CIO at the Army Corps of Engineers, and he was talking about the culture associated to the adoption of a zero trust architecture, which I thought was kind of interesting. Bob, I wanted to just get your reaction. I always hear uh, about, hey, there's a lot of tools out there. And if you just sort of, you know, turn the gears and flip the switches, you know, half your architecture uh, could be uh, could be realized. What's your observation of that? We're actually getting a couple of good questions uh, here too that I'm gonna weave in, but you know, what, what, what's your sense of that? Uh, I think I've heard that for about 25 years now. <laughs> you know, everything that we go through and that everyone's going to give me a single pane of glass. Um, I, I, I think that there are a lot of good solutions out there. Uh, I think that one of the areas uh, we struggle with, uh, you know, particularly in the government uh, where private sector maybe has some of it, uh, a bit of an advantage, uh, you know, often say you work for company X, Fortune 100, 500, doesn't matter. The CIO there can be pretty prescriptive and kind of design things. Often in the government, we talk about rogue IT or silos and, you know, things that, that we've inherited. It can make it a little bit hot, harder. I have that, that problem here. I have, you know, islands of uh, solutions that don't all work uh, together or the same. And it, it, it's made tool implementation a little bit difficult. You still need people that to, to run the tools and understand the tools and, you know, work with the vendors. I think one of the areas we're trying to improve here is a deeper relationship uh, with our vendors instead of keeping them hands off, which was maybe a little bit more traditional approach here at MPPD or CISA. I want to bring them in. They need to know what what's working, what's not working uh, and, and work with us closer because, uh, you know, that's really key to success. If you don't have a deep relationship with your vendors and you're not going to be successful. Right. And I always refer to them as partners versus vendors. The reality is uh, uh, this is a partnership. There's no question about that. Um, we'll get back to maybe that sort of uh, flipping the bits kind of thing, because it, it does seem like there's a, a lot of good technology present inside of these agencies that could be sort of unlocked more than it is today. Mr. Raglan, actually, Grace, let me get to your question. You're asking if the recording will be available. I'm gonna let uh, Megan answer that. I think the answer is yes. Um, um, and uh, I'll let Bob answer the, uh, has CISA hired a CISO yet? Uh, but before we get to that, Tom Raglan has a question and it's a good one. Hearing your OCIO build out and development plan is underway, can you briefly describe your team, roles, resp current responsibilities? I know you did that at the mini town hall. Some people were able to see that. Uh, some weren't. Uh, I don't think that's recorded. But yeah, just give us how, how are you laid out there? I think sure. that is important uh, uh, as these partners are looking to interact and, and, and work close with your community. Well, well, anything for General Ragland. Um, so uh, we're, we're set up more very similar to some of the other component uh, CIO offices. So it's myself and the, the deputy CIO. Okay. Uh, the, the CISO uh, is, will be reporting to the deputy. Uh, right now it's, it's a, a peer uh, relationship. Uh, we have an engineering uh, division, an operations division, and then a uh, investment uh, ITAR compliance uh, division as well. That's a little bit different than some of the compliance work that happens in the CISO shop. Uh, you know, obviously we're a little bit smaller than some of the other components. Like at, at CBP, you know, I worked there for nine years, never really worked with, you know, some of the things I'm, I'm having to do now because we're just so compressed here, uh, for, for the amount of, uh, work that we have. So, uh, right now the operations and engineering areas are a little bit uh, newer, they're getting, you know, sized up new contracts, mm -hmm. uh, new teams, we're doing different work uh, than was done previously. Uh, and within the operations area, there will be, uh, you know, a field operations, headquarters operations. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then in the engineering side, it's all kind of one right now, but that'll probably split out with application development going out on its own. And then I'm strongly considering where ICAM will live because I don't know that it can really live in any of those areas. It's okay. going to kind of straddle the, the entire environment. So I think mm -hmm. medium to long-term we'll have an ICAM uh, or something similar to, to, to that yeah. uh, kind of straddling all those areas. So fairly, uh, fairly uh, um, 
common sort of uh, uh, structure as far as the CIO shop is concerned. And, yeah. and, and let's, and I don't think it's a secret that, uh, that there's a lot of build going on, let's say, uh, in, uh, in your operating components inside of CISA, right? As we, we sit in on those many uh, um, uh, uh, industry days, we see some of that, right? And I'm sure over time that, uh, that, that uh, balance may, may change, which will require you, you all to continue to, to beef up. Have you hired a CISO yet? I, I, I heard, uh, I think you implied that that hasn't been hired, but I want you to... I we're still going through the the process and okay. uh, that so that that's yeah that's probably the most i can say is that it's going through the yeah, yeah. Uh, All right. so the, it's... Uh, the 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 uh, the normal federal uh, processes for hiring yeah okay well good luck with that thank you um, let's talk about technical debt right um, there's no question that uh, you you took on that uh, like anyone does and that you've uh, you're, you've gone through, a, presumably, a discovery process of sort of understanding your environment, what you're dealing with. Um, uh, tell us about uh, what the uh, state of the state is as far as your observation, technical debt, and then how you're sort of approaching that whole challenge. I, I think uh, one of the things that, that for me that's been uh, surprising, having been a you know, long-term DHS member, I think I started working for you in 2008, uh, you know, been here a while. Uh, I didn't know everything that CISA did, nor did I know everything that NPPD did. So, you know, I've learned a lot, like our emergency communications division is doing some really amazing work and working really closely with them. They have some really great uh, PMs over there and a really critical mission. I, I think that you know, what I've learned is, is that the, the problems I have are not dissimilar than the problems I've had in the past or that other CIOs or CISOs are, are having as well, like ATO modernization and automation. It's like a really big thing. Uh, it, you know, rapidly onboarding SaaS solutions and enabling our users, uh, I think is, is really important. I, I think one of the challenges that makes it maybe a little bit harder here is I kind of liken it to if I was the head of HR at uh, OPM. I'm telling the rest of the agency how to do HR when they're telling the rest of the federal government how to do HR. So often, uh, you know, my team sure. is telling CSD, well, you're not, you, you know, we want X, Y, Z. And, it, you know, it's, a, it's something very difficult to navigate uh, internally. Uh, and it's, it's definitely something that I didn't uh, think about before, because I was more used to, you know, the majority of, you know, running IT uh, majority under the CIO, and that that's been a little bit of a challenge, to to, to be honest. But you know, yeah. de definitely, it's been a fun year. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly a delicate balance, right? That, that just uh, sort of uh, came to be that way for whatever reason. You've entered on duty. You're examining that type of situation, and uh, and again, I don't think uh, any of us should underestimate that snap off, right? Mm -hmm. That's going on there, and trying to dismantle some of those goods and services, and and get to a point where you're autonomous it's sort of that storming you know forming norming performing kind of situation that you're in mike i'm sure you've seen a variety of scenarios uh, along uh, the lines of certainly the one we're describing but a whole bunch of others where you sit and seen the good the bad and the ugly in regards to how one would get to a point where they understand the technical debt and then start to move on that journey out of that so that they can start to increase the velocity, et cetera, et cetera. Tell us about your observations that maybe some lessons learned that, uh, that Bob and others can incorporate as they go on this journey. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I've seen a lot of technical debt uh, at my time, uh, Red Hat and across the federal government. Uh, it's interesting too that, uh, you know, Bob mentioned SaaS, rapid onboarding. Uh, and I think that really summarizes one of the big cybersecurity challenges these days, especially with respect to cybersecurity uh, technical debt. And that is that, uh, and I've described it as an arms race between uh, threats and attackers and uh, our defensive teams. And it's an arms race in the sense of, you know, we, we try and protect our systems as best we can, but uh, we ultimately end up uh, in many cases in this reactive mode and it's who can patch or update or respond to incidents as, as fast as possible. Uh, and really technical debt stops you from doing that. When you have legacy systems or when you have systems that you can't touch because they're too fragile or you risk operations in production because 
they can't accommodate patches or updates without significant testing or evaluation. Uh, that's really where the, the tension comes into play. Uh, and honestly, it's a big problem, especially with respect to the, the uh, workforce challenges we have in IT generally. And uh, cybersecurity is maybe a, an acute example of that, but just generally across the workforce, where we have a tremendous amount of uh, IT specialists, application, data specialists, and things like this, many of which are you know, ending their terms of service. And, and the pool of, of resources getting thinner, IT systems that have been in place for 20, 30, 40 years in some cases, uh, don't have the resources necessary to, to move those mission critical systems in many cases forward and update them and modernize them. In some sense, the best strategy is the strangler pattern. You, know, you slowly try and move away from those uh, systems by rebuilding in, in, a, in a replacement or a modernized sense, uh, moving on to more modern architectures, more robust systems, and more uh, uh, implementations where there's an existing talent pool uh, that you can recruit and use. Uh, and that has, has certainly helped, but uh, we also have to use you know, our enterprise architecture. Zero Trust, I think, is widely seen as a good way to tackle this problem by providing external to those uh, legacy systems or that uh, the systems that we can't op operate or maintain, or we consider that uh, you know, highly debt ridden, uh, isolating them or protecting them in a, in a more comprehensive sense. Uh, interesting uh, aspects and, uh, and certainly uh, an interesting perspective looking at it from the vantage point of, uh, that you are. Got a question in here from an anonymous attendee, which is awesome. Uh, and it's a, it's a fair question. What is the difference between CISA and DHS? I think we're back to that hold, you know, uh, and I think it's important. I, I won't mention names, but once upon a time that there, there was always confusion about this. Um, so yeah, what, what, where is CISA fit inside of, is it beside DHS, above DHS? Are they reporting to the White House? How does that work? Yeah, so we are an uh, operating component of DHS, the same as Customs and Border Protection, ICE, TSA, uh, or FEMA. So the director of CISR, uh, you know, Jen Easterly, uh, is the, the head of the agency. So similar to the commissioner of CBP, but we are very much a part of DHS. Uh, we are, you know, a component within the Department of Homeland Security. So we have our own unique mission and authorities, uh, but we are at the same level as all the other uh, operational components, whether it's Secret Service, TSA, uh, CVP, FEMA, ICE. Uh, hopefully I didn't miss anyone. <laughs> we have less than 10 minutes left, so we're going to cook along here. Uh, one of the things that I definitely want to ask you about is... Um, there was some discussion you had about uh, identity management and uh, and sort of data security, and um, I think it sounds like you're going to get laser focus on identity management, perhaps even uh, uh, elevate it. Um, sort of what's your strategy on data security? Uh, well, the, you, you know, there's a couple, and and one of the the interesting things I'm I'm sure you and others went through it. Like I don't get to be the expert anymore, so I got to rely on. Uh, a lot of experts to help me. So we have a phenomenal uh, person, Grant Dasher, that joined us from Google that, that's really helping me. He works in the cybersecurity directorate, but he's helping day in and day out, uh, you know, modernize uh, CISA or CIO and providing a lot of expertise. Uh, so I think that's one of the areas too, is like leaning on, on experts in, in different areas. Uh, we're trying to, you know, I'm trying to be very open. I don't want to replicate you know, work that I did previously just because it worked at another component. I think we mm -hmm. have to be a little bit different here at uh, CISA, a lot more agile uh, and a lot more flexible. I, I have to do things here in the IT realm that other components don't, 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 don't have. You know, when I was working uh, at CVP and ensuring Border Patrol had the systems and uh, devices and technology they needed, it was a much different issue than here where I, you know, I have people, uh, you know, doing very deep level technology work, whether it's, you know, threat hunting or vulnerability management or all those other issues. So it's, it's a little bit of a balancing act here. It's like, it's probably the only component where there may be more people with uh, privilege level access outside the CIO's office than inside the CIO's office. Interesting. Um, how do you identify uh, your most important assets? What's that process look like? I, I think you got to listen in regards to, to protection and balancing risk. 
sure. it can't all be, you know, the same. No, I mean, you, you, you know, a lot of us that have been in the government for a, a, a while, it's, you know, what are those mission critical functions, whether they're defined in statute or from the department, mm -hmm. you know, those systems that are absolutely required for the department to perform its mission to protect the homeland, you, you know, those are our crown jewels that, that, that we work to, to protect the most. I, th I think also too, it's, you know, raising the, the bar across the board and, and working with our partners to, to do that. You know, I wanna make solutions easy to consume. Uh, Cause if I go to my customers and I'm like, well, I have this great service for you, but it's gonna cost 20% of the, you know, the, the budget of your program, they're just gonna go build something themselves. Yeah. And, and that's- And create more risk. And create more risk. And that's not what we want. So it, it's up to me to find a way to, uh, you know, fight for the, the budget and then provide solutions that work for the programs uh, and, and also, you know, ensure that we're, you know, following CISA guidelines uh, and, you know, really setting the, the bar pretty high for the rest of the department. And, and something that's executable. I'm yes. going to start with you, Mike, on this question. It's a great question, actually. S. Sage, zero trust does not replace defense in depth. Is this a concern? So that's actually a good one. I want to hear, uh, Bob, your, your point of view on that as well. Any sense of that? Yeah, I'll uh, say that it hasn't replaced, no, nor should it. Uh, they are complementary concepts. Uh, defense in depth is, and I'm going to steal a line from Sean Carroll, one of the, one of the folks at CISA. Uh, it's not about building uh, better walls, but about building better gates. But you still need the walls, right? You cannot right. rely on just the gates because people can bypass those if your walls are also weak. So you need the, that defense in depth. You need strong uh, default security. You need to be able to ensure and prove that you have that. And that's what a compliance and compliance is all about. Uh, and things like ATOs are going to be an important part of that puzzle for a long time still. Uh, and it's then about building those strong gates. And we talked a, a moment ago about like uh, uh, privilege access. And I think, uh, you know, I heard Bob mention that right away. And, and, you know, one of the things that we need to do, and, and I think this is where uh, his alignment with easy to consume comes naturally with the, the concerns around zero trust and defense in depth, which is that, you know, if we want to make zero trust work, if we want uh, defense in depth to work, we have to make those things easy to consume, easy to use. And part of that means fewer privileged access, right? Uh, the fact is that like privileged access should be an exception to the rule. It should have an exception process. Uh, we should not be handing out privileged access, uh, you know, according to Zero Trust, to anyone who wants it. And there should be very few people with privileged access. And that really means access is aligned to what their business function is. And if we do it right, that business function will naturally be aligned with their accesses. And that should be easy to, to use. And that's sort of what like things like SSO are all about, uh, which is to say that your access is determined programmatically and, and you're granted access on that need to know and uh, immediately given access to those systems based on your business function, based on your defense in depth, very important guards, gates, and locks always going to be there. Bob, I'm going to give you the last word here. We're wrapping it up. Um, uh, tell us about your recruiting efforts and then finish with your top priorities. Uh, What's it looking like for the, for the remainder of the year for you? Well, I, definitely, I, you know, CISA is on a big recruiting push right now. I do do encourage everyone to, to kind of check us out. We have everything from entry level to very senior executive uh, positions, including some uh, positions in the cyber talent management system or the, the cybersecurity service here at, at DHS, which is a new accepted service um, uh, system uh, for cybersecurity professionals. Uh, I, I think my top priorities, like if we were to say, like, what are we going to do in the next 90 days? Uh, you know, we're finishing up some big work to modernize one of our environments here uh, that I think in the next 90 days, days we'll really have that, that kind of ready to go and, and, you know, hopefully complete the migration by the end of December. Uh, so I'm super excited about that because we're migrating an on-prem system to, to a really modern cloud uh, solution. I think, uh, you know, other than that, I, I have some other priorities that, you know, I never thought I'd have, uh, you know, paperwork reduction out, records management, and a few other functions or, or things I'm actually uh, busy uh, working through here. Uh, and one of my other passions has always been 
Section 508 and assistive technology, and we're going to form a really good program here. It says uh, around that we don't currently have one uh, that really meets the, the the needs of the agency or requirements. So I'm hoping to to get that stood up and and funded to to kickstart FY23 uh, and really address those concerns as well. A day in the life of a CIO, we really <laughs> do appreciate it. Mike, take us out. Final thought. Yeah, I'm actually glad that uh, Bob mentioned things like 508 compliance. I think we sometimes forget <laughs> that you know cybersecurity uh, uh, systems and HR and things like that are a lot more than just security. Sometimes it's compliance, it's usability. If we want to do things like tackle our workforce challenges, we have to make our systems more usable and more uh, usable for wider array of people with different types of abilities. Uh, and that's I firmly believe that's an important part of you know any strategy we have. And I think that you know going back to that ease of consumption and ease of use part, you know, it's going to be things like accessibility, uh, enabling work from home and remote access of our systems while still being secure. And uh, I'm glad to hear that CISA is going to be launching that 508 program. And uh, I hope that we can build that into our open source technologies and a more holistic basis. And uh, enable our users in those respects. Blocking, tackling, and basic high, high, uh, cyber hygiene wins the day every time. We really do appreciate it from both of you.